Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give this just a minute before I start just to let the last folks trickle in, but then we'll get started. Okay, let's call that good. Uh, so today, our plan, as I have written here on the outline, uh, is that we're first going to talk about stuff from the syllabus. I have a few points, a few things I want to emphasize. It is posted to Katie, so if you want to look along as I go over it, I'm certainly not going to read you every word. It looks probably a lot like other syllabi that you have seen at this point. I'm going to go over every question that people posted about 2.1, but also have the opportunity for you to ask more questions. If more things came up as you were thinking about it or as our discussion continues, I'll give you lots of opportunities to think about those things. And I will talk about, sorry, and I will give you an opportunity to work on this homework assignment, the first piece, which is to get used to using LaTeX, which is basically a computerized software that lets you write stuff that looks like math. So probably every math textbook you've ever used was written in LaTeX, or at least the vast majority of them. Uh, it will be a little cumbersome at first, but by not too far into this course, I think you'll be pretty used to it. And then it will be something that you'll end up using in most of your other upper division math courses for homework and these sorts of things. Okay. Uh, I will remind you, or tell you for the first time, uh, that there is a quiz Friday. I should write this here. On chapter two. So that is on the material from two, one, two, two, and two, three, uh, which is the totality of chapter two. Uh, that will be done in LaTeX in class, so you can plan for that appropriately. Note all the due dates for the homework are all listed on Katie, although I realize now as I'm saying that that I've not actually given you a place on Katie to turn in the homework, but I will make a note to myself and fix that. Okay. So let's start by going over the syllabus. So you've seen the video of sort of like what the point of the course is. So I'm not going to go over what the point of the course is or the overall sort of like topics we'll cover because I talked about that in the video. Uh, but in terms of stuff about grades and office hours and that kind of thing. Uh, so first of all, I'm intending to do office hours after class, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So However long class takes, I'll hang around afterwards and ask or let you ask questions. I intend to continue posting lots of videos, so I expect most of the time class will not take the full two hours. I expect most of the time it'll be closer to one hour, but basically the class will bleed into then being office hours, so you can then ask any questions about the homework or show me solutions you've been working on or whatever form that happens to take. Uh, I should emphasize up front, uh, I've of course been teaching online for a while now, but this course is rather different in flavor uh, than those I have done before. So I'm intending to be fairly flexible and willing to change mediums if I find that this YouTube version doesn't work as well as Zoom or whatever. So I'll keep as transparent as possible with you about exactly what it is that I'm planning at any given point, uh, but I'm going to welcome feedback and encourage feedback from you on what works best for you as far as making sure you get this material and get the practice and the feedback that you need. Okay, uh, as I mentioned in one of the videos, but I will reiterate, uh, there's an optional textbook for this course. And so when I write something like section two one, I'm referencing the section numbers that match in the textbook. Right? You do not need the textbook if you do not want the textbook. 
However, I do think this... However, I do think that of all the textbooks on this rough collection of topics that I've looked at, which is a lot, I think this is the book I like the best. And so if you're the sort of person who, in addition to videos, would like to be able to read someone else's perspective on something, I think this book is about as good as you're likely to find. So I will, as I said, leave it to you whether you want to purchase it. And if you don't want to purchase it for now, but you decide later, hey, I really would like something to read, well, it's there for you. Okay. So grade in this course really comes from two places. So there's going to be homework and exams. So uh, in terms of your Luther educational requirements, this is a writing course, uh, which means that there will be a lot of writing in it. In particular, most of that writing will happen on the homework. Uh, as such, uh, you need to do a passing grade on the homework in order to pass the class. So you need to keep your homework average above 60%. Uh, or you cannot pass the class. So bear that in mind. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to try and keep posting uh, the homework once per week to Katie so you can see what's coming, see when everything's due. Uh, as I have done this week, the homework will include the due dates for each thing, just so you can see roughly what's going to be expected of you and plan appropriately. Okay. At the start of the homework for week one, there is a whole page where it explains all of the different expectations in terms of homework. So it explains what sorts of symbols you can use and not use, uh, what things should be written in sentences, uh, the fact that it should be written in law tech, et cetera, et cetera. So you should read those carefully before you start turning in homework, just to make sure uh, that you're comfortable with all of these pieces. Okay. Uh, right. uh, also, uh, this is going to be a course where it is very easy to sort of smile and nod your way through lecture because I'm going to be saying lots of words and it will seem like the words make sense, hopefully if I do my job right. Uh, but then it's very easy to find yourself in the unfortunate situation that everything made sense, but then you go to do the homework and you can't or you feel like things are going pretty well, but then you get to the test and there are not so much. Uh, so in order to sort of make sure you keep constantly aware of where you are, there's gonna be fairly frequent quizzes uh, in this course, just to give you sort of that instant feedback of, if I have to do this question, am I comfortable with all of the pieces of this? Okay. Uh, now, we're online for the for the foreseeable future, uh, so for at least three weeks. So those quizzes are going to be done online, and so you'll tech them, which is just the verb for, form of put in LaTeX, uh, and turn them in on Katie as you'll work with other things, but I'll just post them right before class. So we'll see how exactly that ends up working, but that's the plan. Okay. Uh, There'll also be three exams in the course, plus a final. Uh, the three exams will count for 20, 20, and 10%, with the 10% being your lowest of those exams. Uh, all of those will be done in LaTeX uh, during class time, whether we're on campus or not. Uh, and likewise for the final exam, uh, which will count for the remaining piece of your grade. Okay. Uh, the scale in this grade, the, the scale for grades in this course is a little different than you're used to, but it's in your favor. So the A range drops down to 85. So something like an 87 would be an A minus. Uh, something like a 95 would be an A, that kind of thing. Uh, the B range drops down to 70, and then the C range drops down to 60. So basically what I did is I removed the D range and then just split that 10 points from the usual scale into the A and B range. Uh, so when you see letter grades reported on your homework or whatever, I'm telling you, like, remember this scale, which is a little different uh, than the 90, 80, 70 scale that you're used to. 
it's basically just a little bit more generous. Uh, all right. Uh, if you need additional help, uh, you should come to office hours, which are after class Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and also at class time, class time on Tuesday, Thursday, uh, meaning 11. If you need other times, let me know. We can probably work something out uh, to set up so that you can ask questions. Uh, if you have private questions uh, about your grade or whatever, probably those are best handled by email rather than by something on a public YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, that's basically the plan. Okay, so that is a very rough outline of the syllabus. Are there any questions about any of these things so far? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to switch to talking about people's questions about 2.1. So I'm going to make room so that you can see the paper. Probably also the sound is much better. Could someone, by the way, tell me that they can hear me? I think you can hear me, but just to be sure. success. Okay, so I've recorded here all the questions uh, that I got in various flavors. Again, if you think of different questions, please put them in the chat and I will happily answer them. Okay. Uh, so the first question was about statements which are true but whose converse is false. So remember, first of all, what a converse is. So every implication has a converse, which is just the same implication in the opposite direction. So the key punchline of all of this section, and the thing that's going to show up a lot, is that sometimes the implication is true and the converse isn't. Okay. And so here's an example that I think works quite well. Uh, if a shape S is a square, then it's a rectangle. So something being a square implies it's a rectangle, uh, but something being a rectangle does not imply it's a square. Uh, now, for many of you, you will have come to this course right out of Calculus 2 of some flavor, and Calculus 2 is almost entirely about uh, cases where the converse sort of fails. So everything about series and convergence ends up relating to things where the converse doesn't quite work. So let me give you a refresher of some examples from Calculus 2 that also fall under this category. Okay. So the first is what's called the divergence test, which said that if some series converges, then the terms go to zero. Right. Now, the entirety, well, the entire second half of calculus two uh, 
would be completely moot if the converse of this statement was true. Uh, because if the converse of this statement was true, well, what is the converse? The converse of this statement is if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is zero, and the series converges, uh, if this were true, then all of those questions that were of the form, hey, here's the series, does it converge or diverge? All you would have to do is see whether the terms went to zero or not. But unfortunately, this converse is false. And dipping into a little bit of a preview of what we're going to talk about in 2.3 and really throughout the rest of the course, why is it false? It's false because there are series whose terms go to zero, but where, but where this series doesn't converge. Okay, so remember, the negation of this implication P implies Q is P and not Q. So in other words, if I want to show you this thing is false, I want to show you a series where this piece is true and this piece is false. Uh, and the example of this series is the harmonic series. This series you'll recall diverges, so that part is false, but the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n is zero, uh, so that part is true. So here, if you look back at this piece uh, from Calculus 2, you have this example where you have a true implication and a true implication that you use all the time, but whose converse is false. And here's an example of why the converse is false. But in fact, almost every divergent series you look at in a typical Calculus 2 class will be a counterexample to the converse of the divergence test. Okay, are there questions about that of any sort? If you are thinking to yourself, by the way, oh boy, I don't remember any of this stuff about convergence tests from Calculus 2, that's okay, they're not going to come up a lot. They're, they may come up like once on the homework or whatever, but do not be overly concerned if this topic frightens you. Okay. Uh, next up, I got a lot of questions about the distinction between OR and XOR. And I realized, as I suppose I should from, uh, so I realized I should from this to, sorry, I have a question. Let me answer the question first. Uh, does a statement have to be an if-then statement for there to be a converse? Yes, only if-then statements have converses, but there are lots of ways to write if-then statements that do not involve the words if and then. So, for example, the word implies is another way to write it. And sometimes people will refer to the converse of something as being the way that they translated it into an if-then statement in their head and then wrote the thing backwards. But fundamentally, both converse and contrapositive are things that only if-then statements have, only implications have. So for example, the statement, uh, 
the statement, there are infinitely many primes, uh, this does not have a converse because it's not an implication. Uh, any more questions about that before I hop to talking about XOR? Okay, so as a means of exploring the difference between OR and XOR, I want to look at this statement, n squared plus 1 is prime, and then either OR or XOR here, n squared plus 3 is prime. And I want to look at whether it is true or false. And so in order to decide if it's true or false, I'm going to need a collection of n's to plug in. So when I plug in 1, what do I get? I get 1 squared plus 1, I get 2 is prime, and then x or, or, or 4 is prime. Okay. Since 2 is prime and 4 isn't, this is in fact true for both. Okay. In other words, both 2 is prime or 4 is prime, and 2 is prime, x or or is prime, both of these are true. Okay. Now, what happens when I plug in n equals 2? I get the statement 5 is prime, and then or slash xor, 7 is prime. Okay. And here's where the distinction pops up. Okay. It is true that 5 is prime or 7 is prime. So here, true. Okay. However, it is not true that 5 is prime xor 7 is prime. And remember, this X stands for exclusive. Okay. And the exclusive there is to remind you that we're not allowing the case that both of them are true. So both of these pieces on the sides, these are both true. So the XOR statement is actually false. Okay, uh, if you continue on, let's just finish filling out this table. Uh, if I plug in three, I get 10 is prime, XOR slash OR, 12 is prime. Both of those pieces are false. And so that means both the OR statement and the XOR statement, they're both false. And in this last line here, where I write down 4, uh, I end up with 17 is prime, and then or or xor, and then 19 is prime. Okay. These statements are both true, and so the or statement is true, but the xor statement is false. Okay, questions about that. Do we understand what I did there with all of that?
Okay, let me make another note about where XOR shows up most naturally. So let's write down a truth table here. And I want to make a note about how we can most naturally think of P, X, or Q. Okay. Namely, P, X, or Q, we should know how to fill this in. So this is false, true, true, false. Okay. And this biconditional, remember this is the if and only if symbol. Uh, this is the implication both directions. And we decided that this is true in the instances where P and Q have the same truth value and it is false otherwise. So in a word, what is the relationship between P X or Q and P if and only if Q? So just to rephrase, when I look at this table and I look at these two columns, what's the relationship between them? What do I notice? That's right, Greta, they're opposites. And so in fact, P, X, or Q, this thing is the negation of P, if and only if Q. So this is a pretty natural way, I think, to think about where the exclusive or comes up. It's exactly the negation of the biconditional. Okay, so I also had a few questions about negation, and in particular, uh, the difference between opposite and logical opposite. And the logical opposite, that's the negation. And so that's the thing that we're talking about in this section and the course more broadly. Okay. Uh, there are a few places where I think this distinction shows up most often. Okay. So 
the biggest one, or one of the biggest ones that's easiest to get caught up in is, sorry, I'm at all versus none. The opposite of all is none, and the opposite of none is all in whatever linguistic sense, but that's not the sense we care about. Okay. And so if I say something like, If I say something like, all sheep in Scotland are black, I could think about the opposite, but it's not useful to think about the opposite. Let's just think about the negation. The negation here would be, and I'm going to write this in a silly way just so that we can think it through. So if not all sheep in Scotland are black, what does that really mean? That really means at least one sheep in Scotland isn't black. And in fact, we'll talk at some length about how exactly negation interacts with all in section 2.3. So that's in the videos that you'll watch for Wednesday. Okay. But going back to maybe more uh, just sort of practice with thinking about this, uh, it's natural to think the opposite of hot is cold, and maybe the opposite of hot is cold, but the logical opposite of hot would be not hot. Uh, and it is definitely possible for, say, your coffee to be not hot, uh, but having coffee that's not hot doesn't mean it's cold. It could be lukewarm, for example. Uh, Uh, this also shows a lot, this also shows up a lot when we're talking about numbers and we say something like X is positive. If you negate that, uh, then it's tempting to think that that is X is negative because the opposite of positive is negative. Uh, however, the opposite of positive is not negative. The opposite of positive is negative or zero. And most often you'll see mathematicians write that as just X is none positive. And why are they doing that? Well, they're just doing that to avoid writing out this longer thing. Now I should note after this week, we're basically never going to use this symbol for not. We're just going to use the words. But the thing we're practicing this week is figuring out what the negations of statements are so that we can internalize it and hopefully make this fairly natural because we're going to need to do this a lot as we talk about things for the rest of the course. So another question was, is, was basically, is there any reason not to just 
write the word not in front of something when you're negating it? Why would you ever write something more complicated than that? Right? And so there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that although it worked here, often if you just stick the word not in front of an English sentence, it will no longer be a sentence. Right? And it's important. Uh, everything you write in math in this course has to be in an English sentence. So certainly you can't just shove the word not at the front of everything in order to negate it. It won't always read correctly. People won't always know what it means. But there's a bigger reason why you should not do that. And that reason is that it's not useful to just put the word not at the front of something. And so you'll see on the homework and exams and these sorts of things for this section, I tend to say something like, write the negation without using the word not, or write the negation in the most natural way, or whatever. What I'm really trying to do is make sure that you're writing the negation in a way that will actually prove useful when you need to write down negations as part of doing proofs, which we'll talk about next week. Okay. So this whole writing down negations of things is going to be an essential skill in the course, but if you just stick the word not at the front, it's going to be unhelpful. It's not going to get you where you need to go. had another question about negating, which is, when do you switch and and or? Uh, and I think this is getting at the fact that we wrote down what I think I called De Morgan's Laws, which was to say that the negation of P and Q is not P or not Q. Okay. And so this and here became an or. And I, in the video, said, and I think this wasn't super helpful, this works whenever this and is a logical and. And so that perhaps raises the question, what is a logical and? And a logical and is one that connects two statements. So remember, a statement is basically a sentence with a truth value. So if this and is a logical and, I could split this off and get a statement P and a statement Q out of it. And that's in contrast to all the other English ways we use the word and. So here, for example, we have x, y, and z are odd. It's a perfectly fine statement. 
But if I try and think of this as a logical and, it's definitely not going to work uh, because x, y is not a statement. And z, r, odd is also not really a good statement. If you made the sacrifice that this was z is odd, maybe, but these this is still not a statement. And so as a result, when you go to negate this, you have to think of it a little bit differently. You can't just say, uh, you can't just flip this and to an or without thinking about it. So most ands you're going to encounter are going to be logical ands. But every once in a while, you're going to encounter one where it's not actually connecting two statements to make a bigger statement. It's actually doing something else. Okay, so just as an example to make sure we get this, I want you to write down the negation of this statement about two real numbers, x and y. And you could just write this on a sheet of paper in front of you, uh, but I'll give you a minute to think about this, decide if this is a logical and or not a logical and, and decide what the negation of this statement is. Okay, so th there's a lot of interesting things going on here when you go to pick apart this. Okay. Uh, first things first, this is definitely not a logical and, because the statement in quotes that you'd be left with on the left would be at least one of x. It's definitely not a statement. So what's going on here? What is this really saying? And so what's the opposite of this. Okay. And so what's the opposite of at least one of x and y is greater than five? This is really asking what's the opposite of at least one of or various things like that. So one way to write this is to say the opposite of at least one of is neither. Uh, so this is a perfectly fine way to write down the negation of this statement. But there are many other ways to write down the negation of this statement, depending on how exactly you think of it. Okay. Uh, note, by the way, 
I actually could have tricked myself here if I would have both negated this at least one of and also the greater than five, because then I would have basically negated the thing I was looking at twice and written down something that was equivalent to the original statement. So be very careful about this. You sort of want to think about the world as you're talking about it. And so just to draw you a picture here, uh, If I look at this and think of life as sort of split into four boxes, where x is either greater than 5 or less than or equal to 5, and y is either greater than 5 or less than or equal to 5, then if I look at this first statement, the first statement is describing, so this is my original statement, My original statement is describing every box except this one. Right. So So then the negation should be describing the opposite of that. So the negation should be describing this. Okay, which is x is less than or equal to five and y is less than or equal to five. Okay. And so that's actually a completely different way to frame the negation of this statement, namely just that. And I would argue actually, this is a much, much nicer way to write the negation than this one. we come up with this? Well, we could write out the tables. There's actually a different way to come up with this negation, which is to think back to the original statement and realize what the original statement is really saying. Okay. Uh, namely, what is this original statement really saying? If you want to spill it out in terms of x being greater than 5 and y being greater than 5. Right, x or y is greater than 5. Or if you prefer, you could even write that as x is greater than 5 or y is greater than 5. Right, these are all different ways of saying the same thing. Okay. 
So why of all those ways do I happen to like this one and this one the best? And the reason is this or here is a pure logical or. It is connecting two statements. X is greater than five is, or Y is greater than five. And so I can just think about this purely in terms of the logic. Okay. If I went instead with something like this, This is another way of the many, many ways to say this original statement. But here, this or isn't a logical or. And so I have to think carefully about what exactly this is saying in order to negate it. OK. But again, once I've written it this way, with this x is greater than 5 or y is greater than 5, this is a logical or, so I can negate this straight through in the sort of mindless way of saying, okay, so I turn x is greater than 5 into x is less than or equal to 5, I turn or to and, and I turn greater than 5 into less than or equal to 5, and then bam, I have that. Okay, I also have a question about do I need to include the possibility of both being greater than 5? And I definitely do need to include the possibility of both being greater than five. And that possibility is included in the word or. So this is this goes back exactly to the distinction between or and XOR from earlier. Uh, namely, our or is always true if at least one of these is true. So our or here is true even when both of these are true. But you're right. This possibility of x is greater than 5 or y is greater than 5, it really sort of accounts to three different states of reality. Uh, one of those is where x is greater than 5 and y isn't. One of them is where y is greater than 5 and x isn't. And the other is where both x and y are greater than 5. Now, I should note, quite often you're going to see people, and you might yourself, want to write something in a way that looks a little splashier than x is greater than 5 or y is greater than 5. You might prefer to write a sentence like this because it makes the paragraph you're writing flow a little bit better. It makes it feel a little less stodgy or whatever. And so that's why you're going to spend a lot of time in this course sort of figuring out how to translate the ways people choose to write mathematical sentences back to these building blocks of and, or, implies, etc. Because there are a lot of different ways to say the same thing, which you need in order to make your writing sound like writing and not sound like uh, robot code. Okay, uh, let me give a minute just because that's a lot to take in to see if there are any more questions about that. And then I will talk about other things. Okay, so of the questions that were submitted on Katie, uh, the last one, I think I've covered everyone's, although if you think I did not cover yours, or if you have a new question, please let me know. But I think the last one was when I read something like, this statement is about x and y real numbers, 
Am I supposed to think of these x and y as being variables, or am I supposed to think of them as being fixed? And so this is a complexity that is introduced by the fact that we have not really talked about how to talk about variables yet. Namely, the way we talk about variables is using quantifiers, and that's what's in 2.3. Okay. And so as a result, because we haven't talked about how to use variables yet, whenever we're, <clears throat> whenever we're doing things in 2.1 and I give you some context like about x and y in R, I'm basically telling you to think of x and y as fixed. Okay. So the answer to the question, should I think of these things as variables or as fixed, is that you should think of them as fixed for purposes of 2.1 uh, but we'll learn about how to think about things as variables later, and that will introduce further wrinkles into the different ways mathematicians say the same things. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump on to LaTeX in a minute, but before we get to talking about LaTeX, are there any more questions about anything to do with the content of Okay, so with that, I want to shift to talking about LaTeX. So one moment as I shuffle this around. How about that? Okay, so here, and I apologize for the poor centering. I can try and fix it. Maybe that's a little better. Uh, so here is Overleaf, and Overleaf is really a godsend as far as working with LaTeX goes, because you don't have to install anything on your computer, you can just use it on the website. So I really recommend make an Overleaf account and you'll be in good shape. Okay, if you haven't done it yet, you could do everything we're doing today without making an account. You'll just want to make an account to make sure you can save it. Uh, it will try and, of course, get you to make a paid account, uh, but no one has ever needed a paid account for anything with Overleaf that they've had to do for me before. Uh, so you do not need to make a paid account in order to use Overleaf. Okay. Uh, what I have pulled over here, what I have pulled up here, is the list of Overleaf homework templates. Uh, so I recommend starting your homework by going here and finding a template that you like. I'm going to choose the Bates College Physics homework template, uh, but feel free to play around with these other templates or make your own template, whatever works for you. Uh, then you'll want to click open as template. And so you'll see here, this is what LaTeX will look like when you sit down to do this. So on the left hand side, you have this collection of code that looks kind of like HTML. And on the right hand side, you have what it's going to look like when you actually turn it in. Okay. So you're going to edit the text on the left. So if I want to make this my name and my email address, 
can do that. And then when you hit recompile, it will rewrite this thing with the right information. Hopefully. Something went wrong while rendering this video. Oh no. Of course now it is going to uh, have problems. What went wrong? There we go. Okay. No idea why it didn't work, uh, but that will work. Uh, so this will let you make these edits. And so you can change this to like math 220. Okay. And so the thing you want to do today while we talk about this is to pull up the homework assignment from Katie. The first question gives you this equation that it wants you to type up in LaTeX. So I'll go ahead and tell you uh, just a little bit about typing stuff in LaTeX, but then I'll sort of let you go because you can Google most of this, but I'll be here and so you can ask me if something comes up. Okay, so. So let's do this like this. Uh, so, the homework, if you pull up the PDF, uh, starts with, oops. starts with a sentence that reads, uh, the quadratic formula asserts. That if, okay, and then it wants you to type this set containing A, B, and C with these little braces. Uh, and then it wants to be a subset of, and then this R being the real numbers. Okay. And so here's the first thing in LaTeX. Anytime you want to type math stuff, you have to put it in dollar signs like that. Okay. And so you will be very tempted, I will bet, to type that uh, and if you do that, you will see that it does not work. Uh, and so What's wrong with this is that the set braces are not showing up, right? Uh, and so when you're between dollar signs, what LaTeX is looking for is it's looking for commands to tell it what you want to do. Right? And as you can see by looking various other places in this document, uh, LaTeX uses these braces, which also happen to be set braces, in order to denote off blocks of things that it's looking for. And so basically LaTeX is saying, ah, you want to group A, B, and C together? Great, I'll do that. And then it doesn't show you anything. But all LaTeX commands are set off with this backslash. And so where you see this make title, you see this slash here. And so you'll always want to use commands that start with that. And so the command for a set bracket is actually that same set bracket, but with a backslash in front of it. Okay. And so you'll see that if you do that, lo and behold, you get this symbol. Okay. Uh, are there questions so far about what is going on with this LaTeX thing. I think this will be pretty straightforward, uh, but I just want to go through like the first line 
before I unleash you to figure this out uh, for yourself. By the way, you can change the mode uh, to whether it is auto recompiling every time you make a change or only recompiles when you click the recompile button. My experience is that most students prefer the auto recompile. I usually do it the other way, but whatever works for you. So the next thing on the homework is this particular symbol that looks like a sideways U with a line under it. Okay. Uh, and you might happen to know what that symbol is called, in which case you can Google how to do it in LaTeX. Uh, but you might not know what that symbol is called, uh, in which case there is this beautiful tool called Detecify. Okay. And I always just Google Detecify to find this. Uh, and what this tool lets you do is draw the symbol that you want to find and it will tell you what the symbol is. So if I attempt to poorly reproduce uh, that, I will see, lo and behold, right here, the command in LaTeX for that symbol. And it will tell me this code backslash subset ek. So I can go ahead and type that code, that command, backslash subset ek. And then when this recompiles, you will see that command now appears inside my file. Okay, next up, we have this R thing uh, that you've probably seen before. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you that is the MathBB font. So that will show up as MathBBR. And so that gets you through the first line there. And so you can type more, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, if you look on the homework and then you see where it gives you this quadratic formula business, uh, you'll see that this thing is centered rather than being in line. And when you want something centered like this, you want to put it in double dollar signs. Okay. And you can either press enter or not, uh, but double dollar signs will tell you, hey, I want this thing like this. And so you'll get x equals, oops, x equals, uh, and then the way you make something a fraction is to type backslash frac, and then two sets of curly braces like that. And then you type the thing you want here, uh, which in this case, since this is supposed to be the quadratic formula, is this. over that. Okay. Uh, and then we have here the quadratic formula appearing. Okay. Now, LaTeX has been around since I think 1971. Uh, so it is nearing 50 years old. Uh, and as a result, there is an enormous amount of stuff written about it. So much so that almost any LaTeX question you have, if you just Google, how do I blank in LaTeX, it will come up with a million responses where you can just copy paste code. Uh, so if you didn't know, for example, how do I make fractions in LaTeX, if you Google, how do I make fractions in LaTeX, it will tell you. Or likewise, how do I make tables, etc., etc. All right, so what I intend to do now is to go quiet, let you work on this, search for these things, use Detectify, use the various tools, but I'm going to be here while you work on it to answer any questions that you come up with 
as you try to transcribe this uh, block of text with this fairly complicated looking equation and get it to compile in the same fashion. Okay. Uh, I would recommend especially pay close attention and try and make sure you're comfortable uh, with everything that shows up here. Make sure your thing really looks like this and that you ask me if you're struggling with something. Okay. But for now, go on Overleaf and start trying to type this all up uh, and see how it goes for you. And let me know if you have questions as you work on it.
Howdy, folks. Uh, just a uh, reminder as you work on this, and feel free again to drop questions in the chat. Uh, I did post a spot to Katie for you to turn this in. Just turn it in this afternoon, uh, this evening, whenever you get it done. Uh, I also put a spot on Katie for you to turn in your Wednesday question. So just like today, before Wednesday, I want you to put a question about any of the videos from the next piece. So anything from 2.2 and 2.3. Uh, and we'll talk about those on Wednesday. Also, I have just realized in the process of putting up these assignments that most of the assignments in the packet uh, are stated to be due on days that do not exist, uh, such as uh, Thursday, December 5th, whereas December 5th is not a Thursday, it is a Saturday. So I will post a version of the homework packet with days that actually do exist uh, very shortly. Uh, so you can look forward to that. But definitely let me know if you have any questions as you work on this. For today, just question one is due. I'm about to post this updated PDF, but just to answer your question. For today, just question one is due, just the LaTeX part. Uh, then the video response, as well as questions two and three, are due on Wednesday. Uh, and then two, two, and two, three, the next sections, those will be due on Thursday. So you probably want to look at those before Wednesday so you can ask me questions about it in class. Uh, as we talk about it. As far as submitting the homework, you only want to submit the PDF.
for the record, I think now there is a version of the homework with dates that actually exist listed as due dates that I think are all correct.
Okay, the cube root through the whole thing. Let me pull up a thing and look at what I'm trying to emulate, and then I will uh, help you. pop that back up. Uh, so if I want, oops, cube root of eight, I do something like that. So let that recompile. And so that, uh, gives me something like that, but you're asking, what if I want something like the cube root of eight plus two X, uh, what am I gonna get? And so if I put the braces around here, it should come up. And so the, the key here is making sure your braces match and encapsulate the whole thing. Uh, what will it even do if I don't put that? Will it compile it all or will it just an error? Uh, yeah, so if you don't put the braces af immediately after the backslash square root three, then it will only do that, which isn't what you want. Did you try and post a link, May? It may have eaten it. Uh, but if you email it to me, I can probably post it in the chat, maybe, possibly. Glad I could help. There is the link that May found that is useful. It gives you a bunch of different symbols.
Okay, we want a subscript on a delta. So, the fact that you're calling it a delta means that you've probably figured out that it's backslash delta. Uh, and so subscripts are always going to be something like that. You put the little sub bit. The easiest thing, by, or one of the easiest errors to make, by the way, uh, is that if you try and put a multi-digit subscript, uh, it will not do the thing you want it to do, uh, unless you put braces. Uh, you do not need to imitate my indentations. Absolutely.
Ah, uh, yes, one of these has both a subscript and a superscript. You're right. I think this is an instance where if you do the thing that you might guess it works, which is to use both a underscore for the subscript and a caret for the superscript.
All right, to those of you who are still around, I'm going to duck off for now. Uh, on Wednesday, remember before class to enter your questions. Remember to keep up on the homework assignments, which I know are sort of due constantly because of the accelerated nature of the course. Uh, please do email me if you have any questions. I will also have office hours tomorrow at 11, so if you have any lingering questions about 2.1 or want to talk about the stuff from 2.2 and 2.3 before class on Wednesday, uh, please feel free to drop by tomorrow at 11. But if I don't see you then, I'll see you on Wednesday. Have an excellent afternoon, everyone. And feel free to email me if any sticky LaTeX questions come up between now and the end of today.